Welcome to the screencast for what is it like to be a bat and the qualia problem. So these are two successive articles in our textbook starting on page 153. The official doctrine that Ryle spoke of uh, from our last lecture is a view called dualism. Dualism believe, uh, and dualists believe that the mind and body are separate substances that whole mind-body split. You can also be a property dualist that thinks everything is made up of physical matter, that there's some kind of special organization in minds that lead to qualities like pain and seeing color. So there has to be a certain kind of organization in matter to give rise to this property that can't be broken down into physical things. You don't have to worry about that too much, but if you're interested, you can check out a different article, one that you're not responsible for. Uh, page 143 is where they talk about property dualism. But for our purposes, all you need to know is that dualists think mind and body are two separate things, and that the mental world cannot be explained by the physical one. Materialists, on the other hand, think that there's only one kind of substance in the universe and that's ordinary three-dimensional matter. We're all familiar with it. Uh, and of course, in our contemporary world, most philosophers tend to call themselves materialists. They think mind comes from regular, ordinary matter. That doesn't mean that it's easily explainable. Uh, Thomas Nagel, who is a contemporary philosopher, uh, works at NYU, would probably classify himself as a materialist. But in this article, he poses a, a difficulty or a problem that needs to be explained if materialism is going to be adequately defended as a theory about the way the world is. So, as people, we feel like we experience a phenomenon called consciousness. And when you ask people to define what consciousness is, they say something like self-awareness, usually, or often. Like we understand that we're alive and that we have a thought process and there's something going on inside our heads. Nagel points out that other animals on the planet have to have some sort of level of self-awareness. Well, we aren't really sure which ones do or what aspects of it they might have. We don't think that they have it on the level that we do, but they think about, they think that other animals, especially other mammals, have some sort of internal experience. So think about what that means. When we wake up in the mornings, we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. We might be aware of a running dialogue that's happening in our head, or maybe if we're not thinking specifically, there's just an understanding that it's it feels like something to be alive. And that's another way to think about consciousness, inner experience. So you wouldn't think that a thermometer or a temperature regulator or a microwave has inner experience, but you might think that other creatures that are alive have some level of inner experience. Think about pain especially. Uh, animals react negatively, facially and bodily, whenever something is damaging them. So other animals might not pass the widely known mirror test, but we can see how having a brain and having a nervous system could contribute to some kind of internal life. If you're not aware of the mirror test, it's Having it's the it's an experiment that some scientists have run, especially with other primates, to see if they recognize themselves in a mirror or if they think it's another member of their species. And it's highly controversial, and there are no definitive answers as to whether or not there are other animals that pass the mirror test. But regardless of that high level of consciousness. Most people can agree that there are other animals that possess some kind of internal life. Nagel picks bats, 
and he to illustrate his point. Um, so if you've bought into his argument so far, and you don't really have to, remember that principle of charity. So before you deconstruct or point out flaws in someone's argument, you give them the benefit of the doubt and make sure you understand the strongest version of their argument. So for now, we can provisionally accept that it's at least possible that other animals have internal experience. <clears throat> So Nagel picks bats to illustrate his example because one, they're mammals, so they're more like us than lots of other animals, say insects or fish. But even though they're mammals, they have a sensory apparatus that is vastly different to ours, and that's the navigation by sonar. I read an article that said that bats aren't completely blind, like common uh, knowledge seems to think, but they're mostly blind, especially in bright light. And in the darkness, of course, they do navigate with this sonar equipment. And Nickel thinks that their navigational system is alien enough that we cannot imagine what it contributes to inner life, the internal experience that is some subset of consciousness. So that means there's something it's like to be a bat. Whatever it is that they see, hear, feel, taste and touch when they wake up in the morning or the e evening. So they have an internal world that we can study scientifically, but only up to a certain point. Just like one person can never feel another person's feelings directly or quote unquote see their memories and dreams. So if you close your eyes and you imagine an apple, I can't see what it's like when you imagine an apple. So just like that, we can never imagine the inner experience of a bat, except more completely. You and I have the same sort of sensory apparatuses, So, but the bat is so alien and so different that if we close our eyes and imagine what it's like to be a bat or to have sonar as part of our self-awareness or our inner lives, we can only do so by using our human imagination and our human senses. We can add on sonar, but we can never really know what it's like to have it programmed into us genetically and physiologically. We might imagine in a sci-fi scenario that we could get transformed into a bat, but that's still only imagining a future experience using human self-awareness. Our imaginations will always be incomplete. That means there's an aspect of the physical world that we can never access. We can never study it or fully grasp what it's like to be a bat. Now remember, if you're a materialist, you think that everything in the universe is made up of physical matter. And one fundamental characteristic of matter is that it's available in space and in time, and it's open to observation. But if there are facts about this material world that we can never get to physically, materialism has a problem. And he also has another example. That's a little more far-fetched. That's why he saves it for later of an alien species come, coming to communicate or study us. The picture in the top right is a picture of the gold record that Carl Sagan sent out on Voyager 1, I think. And it's supposed to be our attempt at possibly communicating with an extraterrestrial life. If anybody ran into this, it has basic facts about humanity and some sounds on the record to try and demonstrate to these aliens what human beings are like. But in Nagel's example, the Martians are so different to us. They have all different sensory apparatuses that they can't even imagine that we have an internal life, let alone share some sort of common experience. And he says that if you want to keep being a materialist, if you want to keep thinking that the entire universe is made of simple, ordinary matter, then materialists have to figure out a way to account for these experiential facts. Otherwise, their theory 
breaks down. In the next article, which starts on page 156, Frank Jackson goes deeper into this problem. He further classifies these facts of inner life that Nagel brought up in the mid-70s. So Nagel's article, What It's Like to Be a Bat, um, made a lot of waves in philosophy and in philosophy of mind. And many people were spurred on to think about these experiential facts. And so many people were talking about it that they were named qualia after qualities. And all qualia are, are the what it's like of any inner life. What it's like to feel pain. What it's like to see red. What it's like to feel love. And he asks you to imagine a man who names him Fred, who has better vision than any human being ever has. You can imagine that it's just an excellent example of our current vision. Or maybe it's a mutation where he added another cone to the rods and cones that all other people have possessed. And because of this mutation or this excellence, Fred can distinguish more shades of every single color than anyone else can. We test him and he always sorts colors in the exact same way, even in double blind studies. So he's not arbitrarily choosing or faking it. He actually sees more colors than anybody else, but of course, he can't describe them to anyone. If you give him a bunch of tomatoes and he says there are four different shades of red there, he sees those shades while the average person cannot. And Jackson brings up, well, he brings up H.G. Wells and I've brought out Flatland as examples, fictional examples of illustrating the same point. In The Country of the Blind, a story by H.G. Wells, he talks about one sighted person in a community of blind people. And the sighted person cannot explain this extra sense to anybody, and they never believe him. They think he's a fool. And in Edward and Abbott's Flatland, which I highly recommend, it tells the story of a three dimensional being who visits a universe of two dimensional beings. And this three-dimensional being tries to explain the third dimension to the two-dimensional beings, and they can't get it. They can't possibly get it because their entire brains and existences are built on two dimensions. If something is outside of our material makeup, our sensory equipment, and our cognitive abilities, there's no way to understand what it's like to have those cognitive abilities. We can study Fred's brain, we can study his body, we can study his entire history and psychology, but we can never experience those new shades of color, those new shades of red. We know all of the physical information about Fred, but we don't know everything about Fred. So it follows that materialism does not describe everything about the universe. In the book, uh, Jackson calls it physicalism. It's roughly similar to materialism, and we don't have to worry about the tiny differences. Right at the very end of the article on page 158, Jackson gives us another thought experiment, which actually ironically grew to be a lot more famous than the one he gives more detail in. And it's Mary the Color Scientist. So we have two illustrations over there. Mary at the bottom there shouldn't have colored skin or hair, I suppose. But you imagine she grew up in a black and white room from birth. She's never seen a single color. She's trained as a scientist and she learns everything about vision. She learns everything about light wavelengths and how different colors have different light wavelengths. She learns every single physical fact about the color red. And then at some undetermined time after she's learned all these physical facts, she's let out of the room and she sees a rose. And then she says, oh, that's what red looks like. Did she learn something new about colors when she left that room? And if you say that she did, then there's an extra fact about color that you can only get to when you experience it with a particular sensory apparatus. 
there are people who are physicalists that say that it's not a new fact. She does indeed experience something new, but it doesn't count as something new about the universe. He compares it, and you don't have to worry about this as testing or anything, but if you're curious, he compares it to uh, a machine uh, that doesn't have the appropriate software. So you can't expect a machine to have a new template for something until it's programmed in. That doesn't mean that it's something new in the world. It just means that that machine doesn't have that particular ability. Uh, let, I, let me take a look at the page in question that may or may not explain it better. And this is on page 160. He, uh, he says, and by he I mean David Lewis, tells you to imagine a smart data bank. It can be told things, it can store the information that it's given, it can reason with that information, it can answer questions on the basis of that stored information. So this is a data bank. A bank. And now you can imagine a pattern recognizing device that works as follows. When exposed to a pattern, it makes a template, which applies to the patterns it sees in the future. Now imagine a device with both faculties, like a clock radio. So this data bank, or this imagined thing, can store information and reason with it. And it also, once it's exposed to patterns, can create a template so it understands that there's a pattern. There's no reason to think any such device must have a third faculty, the faculty of making templates for patterns it's never seen before. So all of this example comes down to is the idea that just because you haven't experienced something doesn't mean that uh, it counts as a new fact about the world. And I know that that last example can be a little bit confusing, so if it confuses you, stick to the two articles that are in this screencast and realize that there possibly might be some sort of experiential facts about the world that are inaccessible to empirical observation. That's the problem that both Nagel and Jackson were pointing to.